Father, we thank you for your great love towards us. We thank you that we have brought us safely here, and that we're together again to share once more. We pray that your spirit will speak to us, help us to understand, and more than understanding, give us hearts that want to obey. We thank you, Lord, for your spirit, and we pray now that we may, each one of us, participate not only with you, but with each other. We thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. We uh, have a message. It's not just telling people that Jesus lived and he saved them. We have a message, a Bible message, a word from God to this world at this time. It's called present truth. And we understand what the present truth is in the Bible. So actually when we become Christians at this day and age under this kind of a situation with a message to deliver to the world, that makes us teachers. All of us were born into the kingdom of God as missionaries. No one is born as a chew, a pew warmer. <laughs> we weren't taken into Christianity just to sit around in a church. And so as teachers... When we talk, I wonder if you've noticed what we sound like. Is there a sound of certainty about what you say? There is just no giving it because God has talked to you about it and you know that's what he said. It seems to me that we all of us should be in that position where when we say something, it kind of sounds like we have some authority. <laughs> we leave it to the schoolmen to do all this wishy-washy stuff about we would like to suggest. And, uh, <laughs> you know, we, we, we have read someplace and we think, you know, none of that. We know. That's the only way I've ever seen the Bible people talk. They say, we know. <laughs> and so it seems to me, if we don't know, we better be quiet. Because only the we knows get to say what God has told them. These we knows. Let's go to Acts, the eighth chapter. Let's see. How that happens. Acts 8 uh, 30. You know, while you're looking that up, I, I hope you realize that in the Christian world today, there seems to be something that the people are being taught. When they start talking, the ministers tell them, well, you be real careful how you sound. You want to have charity. Mm -hmm. And of course, by that they mean everybody's got a right to their opinions. Well, I think that probably is correct in one sense. Everybody has a right to their own personal conscience, okay, to their own opinion. But as far as what God said, I don't think anybody has the right to their opinions. Either God said it or he didn't. And he can't say two things that are opposite. <laughs> and I have noticed that when people start talking like that and say, oh, charity, charity, that they don't really know what they believe. I ran into that pretty close to home. Somebody in Washington just this last week sent me a, a little message about 
a group of people who are willing to print this side of the truth and that side of the truth. And I, I said to that person, there are two sides of the truth. <laughs> I said, what is this? If they print the opposites, it means they don't believe anything. And I hate to be that <laughs> straightforward, but I don't know another way. <laughs> All right, so let's look at Acts 8.30. Philip, we know the story. Philip ran hither to him, the, the Ethiopian there, and he heard him read the prophet Isaiah. And he said to him, do you understand what you're reading? <laughs> no, I think that's a good question. Anybody can read the Bible. And a lot of people can quote it. <laughs> but the question is, understandest thou what thou readest? <laughs> that's the question. And I think that if you understand, you have a right to speak with authority because you understand. I don't care who you're talking to. You're talking to some big shot in the church. You're talking to some minister. You're talking to, it doesn't matter who you're talking to. If you know what God has told you and it's in his word and it comes to you through his spirit, there's not two ways to look at this. <laughs> Now, of course, you need to be sure that God has talked to you. But once you're sure, do you think God's going to change his mind? <laughs> okay. So you don't need to worry about that. Now, we need to keep open minds about things we're not sure about. Yes. It needs to bottom out, and God has to teach us. And, of course, that's the whole point. Who's our guide? Let's look at that next verse. He said, the Ethiopian said, how can I? That is, how can I understand? Except some man should guide me. So he knew by himself he wasn't going to get it. He needs to be guided. And I think really he's not saying, give me a man to teach me. I think what he was saying, let God use somebody to show me what this says so I can get it and see what the Spirit tells me. Okay? It's okay to listen to people as long as you don't take their word for it, anybody's. But they can guide you. They can take you to the Scripture and let the Holy Spirit tell you what it says. The Scriptures don't change just because somebody took you there. See? So don't ever be afraid of somebody opening the Bible and showing you a Scripture. All right. So the Ethiopian here is in the right place. He wants to be guided to see what, what else the Bible says. Isaiah says this. What else does it say? And of course we know what, it, what happened there. The scriptures were opened up to him about Jesus. And that's what we want to be able to do is open the scriptures to Jesus. He asked for guidance. We need to ask for God's guidance for understanding we are not going to get this because of reasoning power, because you know how to read, because you went to school and somebody taught you certain things, or you listened to a minister. Those are all helps, but that does not give you understanding. Only God can give you understanding. And when you receive it from him, it's not going to change. So we're talking here about truth. Truth. And it hits me more and more every day how important it is. Truth. There can't be more than one truth. There's only one truth. That truth is Jesus. And whatever is not like Jesus is a lie. Truth. And of course, what Jesus says is the truth. What Jesus does is the truth. And he told his disciples, and that means every Christian, go and teach all the nations what I have commanded you. What Jesus said. 
not what we have invented. And all the various churches today can't all be teaching from Jesus because they're saying different things. There's a real problem with that in my mind. It's the first reason I rejected Christianity. I said it's impossible for all those Christians to be right. They're all saying different things. <laughs> and to me, that made a lot of sense. <laughs> and you know what? After all these years of Christianity, I haven't changed my mind. <laughs> They're either all wrong or one of them is right. But I know one thing, it's impossible for all of them to be right. <laughs> truth, truth is vital. We must hang on to that. We must love the truth. We can be like Daniel, for example. When Daniel was told about the dream, he didn't say, well, I'll tell you what it says. And you know, he never got around to saying, I will tell you what it says. Never. You read that carefully. What did he do when the challenge came to him about that dream? He went and prayed. He says, I know somebody who knows what the dream is. <laughs> and he will show me. And then I can tell you what he said. And when he got in front of the king and he told the king, that's exactly what he did. The king said, oh, you showed me my dream. He said, no, I didn't. God in heaven showed you the dream. <laughs> He's the only one who knows about that. I'm not God. Well, Daniel, he went and he prayed about it so he could understand. John on the island of Patmos. He saw a book that was sealed, seven seals. And he asked around, he says, somebody open it for me, I want to see it. And he was told, nobody can open that book. <laughs> nobody can break those seals. Only the land, the lion, the tribe of Judah. <laughs> and what did John do? He cried <laughs> because he couldn't see what was in the book. <laughs> he was doing liquid prayers. <laughs> yeah, he was praying. He wanted to understand. <laughs> and of course, he was allowed to see what was in the seal. Now, he wasn't allowed to write it, but he saw what the seals were. I wonder if you have seen what the seven seals are because it was given to you to understand them. Yes. The seven seals are open to the last church on earth. They understand. And if you don't have it down yet, maybe you better think about that. You're not done studying. <laughs> you didn't get it all when you were baptized. <laughs> There's more. Maybe the seven seals is one of those more. Go after it. Ask God to show you how that works. I could tell you pages to look up, but that'd be too easy. <laughs> you learn how to study. You ask God to show you things and to lead you to places. Colossians 1.9. Our first chapter is a tremendous chapter. We could spend some time in that chapter. <laughs> Colossians 1 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. Who's the you? Yeah, put your name in that verse. 
He's talking about you. Okay? And desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Now, that's what Paul said, but this is what God wants for you. Now, if God wants that, <laughs> is it going to happen? <laughs> it will happen to every believer. Yes, all of God's promises are for believers, not for doubters. Not for people who don't know if this works. So only for believers. But believers get it. So let's look at that again. This is not talking about Daniel. This is not talking about John. This is talking about you. That you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. So, if you had been in the court with, with Nebuchadnezzar and you prayed to God to be the one, you could do just what Daniel did. Yeah. You! No, we think that, that Daniel was some tremendous individual that he was able to do that. No, he's, it's, it says here in this verse, that God is willing to do that for you, too. You want to see the seven seals? Well, you can. <laughs> God is willing to show you. If you want to do it the way Daniel did and the way John did. Because there's no difference between Daniel and John than what you can do. You know, when you're going to break a rock down, what do you do? Well, first of all, it's going to take a big hammer. <laughs> yeah. And that, that big rock is not going to just fall apart when it sees the hammer. <laughs> you have to apply that hammer diligently. You have to put some strength to it. You have to put some effort to it, or that rock's just going to sit there. <laughs> you want to know about the seven seals? You've got to find a hammer. <laughs> and you've got to start putting the effort in. <laughs> Because the rock's not going to change one bit until you did the effort. That's what Daniel did. You remember about Daniel? Let's just look at that for a moment. He was a teenager. Now, we're not used to thinking about wonderful, wise teenagers, but he was a teenager. <laughs> he was not into dope. He wasn't into all the other stuff. He was a Christian. And he was smart. And when the king saw him, he said, that one we're going to train for us, our side. He's as good as anything we have. And he didn't count on it that he was actually better. <laughs> and when the king saw Daniel and his three friends there, he said, you treat them the way you treat me. You take my food off of the table and you give it to them. Now, king's food, that's a pretty big deal. Except that it wasn't good enough for Daniel. He said, I can't eat that stuff. <laughs> and we know why. It would make him sick. Not, not with a cold or not with a flu or not with bird stuff. Not with cow stuff. 
It was going to make him sick inside. It was going to do something to his body that would make his body fight his spirit. See? That's the issue. People today still don't get it. It isn't because you're going to lay down and die of cancer. That's not the issue. The issue is it's going to unbalance you, and you're not even going to notice it. He knew it. This is going to unbalance me, and I can't afford this around here. So he said, I can't eat the king's food. And they did their little test, 10 days, and everybody saw. They do well without this stuff. <laughs> So they said, okay, we'll do it your way. But anyhow, that is just a little sign of why Daniel showed him what the, I mean, why God showed Daniel what the dream was. Because God could trust him in details. See, not just not murdering and not stealing, and not, but details. God is looking for people who are serious about the little things. Okay? Those little things mount up. There are no little things with God. <laughs> but anyhow, we know who Daniel is. He, he could go with the hammer because he was going to attack the stone with faith and prayer. Real faith, real prayer. Because he knew the secret of both of those. You give your whole self. You hold a piece back? How trustworthy are you? See? Can God trust me if I am holding back? How does he know I'm not going to? Well, he knows, of course, but I mean figuratively. <laughs> How can I be trusted if I'm holding something back? How much will I hold that back? That's why he tested Abraham the way he did. God knew who Abraham was, but he had to show Abraham to himself who he was. <laughs> Hebrews 13, 5. I want to look at the last little clause there. He had said, Paul, and I don't apologize for saying Paul, I don't join that school of scholars that say nobody knows who wrote this book. I know about Hapax Lagoma now. That's a bunch of foolishness. I'm sorry. Paul had somebody write this for him. He didn't have eyes good enough to do this. So he had somebody. That somebody probably was Luke. I'm going to say probably because I don't know for sure. But this is Paul's mind. This is Paul talking. We don't have to worry about that. Okay, it says here, he has said, Jesus has said, I will never leave thee. Now, we're over there in the land now. You remember that? We started in January talking about that. We're still talking about that <laughs> because we're in the land. We're not back there now across the river to that place of unbelief. We're trying to understand what did God say to us because we're in the land. And what are we living now? Jesus said, I will never forsake you. That's the next little part of the clause. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Well, you're over in the land now, and that's the truth. Now, you might have had some problems over there on the other side of the Jordan before with unbelief, and, and that's what happens over there. And you weren't too sure about all this, but now we're over here, and this word is not going to change. Who is saying this? Not who's writing it. Who's saying this? Who's he quoting? <laughs> Jesus cannot lie. 
He says, I will never forsake you. I will never leave you. So the next time you're shaking in your boots wondering where God went, he didn't go anyplace. <laughs> yeah. If somebody moved, guess who? <laughs> yeah, God does not leave us. Now, you notice I said us. There's nothing private about what God does or says. He doesn't do it to one person and then say, I'm never going to do it to that one. What God does to one person, he has to do for all. Okay? That's a principle you can get a hold of. If you have seen him do it to someone in history, you know he can do it with you, and he will if it's necessary. God said it to one, he said it to all. If he gave a well to somebody to drink from, you have a place to drink. <laughs> if he gave food to some poor starving person way over in the world over there, you can eat too. He didn't just, just give it to them. When you see him doing something, he has opened it up for everyone. You know about Abraham? Look at the things he did with Abraham. Well, look at them carefully because he will do them for you too if you need them. If your circumstances require something that he gave to Abraham, you have it available. Look at Moses. Whatever he did with Moses, he's willing to do for you too. So don't make it something, especially he just did one time, it's never going to happen again. And you're sitting there saying, oh, but he did some pretty big things with Moses. <laughs> well, I want you for just a moment to forget your brain and get back in the Bible. There is no blessing too high for you. There is no blessing too extensive for you. There is no blessing too wide for you. You can look in any direction you want, up, down, sideways, all around. And whatever you can see that God has done in blessings, it's yours. Where is the limit to his promises? See, the only place that happens is in our little feeble mind. But God doesn't have that problem. <laughs> I don't want to start talking about his power and his omniscience and his omnipotence and all the, all the omnis. We must just understand there are no limits to what he can do and what he wants to do that he's already demonstrated. We are in the land, and the land has a name. It's the land of milk and honey. <laughs> and again, these are figures of the wonders and the pleasures that God has made for his people, legitimately. He says, I will never forsake you. That is a promise. So you might as well understand that in the land of milk and honey, God said, I will never forsake you. And when he says that, he has given us everything. There's nothing more he can give. He will always be there. So we need to remember, is he mighty? Yeah, we can't imagine the mightiness. All of that is for the believer. 
All the strength of God is for the believers. Is he love? All that love is aimed at us through mercy. He heaps it upon us. Every attribute we can consider about God is on our side. <laughs> There's not one little thing he's aiming against us. So as we consider this, there is nothing we can possibly need ever that isn't contained in that one verse that we were just looking at. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. That is settled for all eternity. Let's take up a, an example here of, of a place we might get into misunderstanding. So we, we see how this works. We, uh, we have heard the expression, and we no doubt have felt at some place along the line, we thought, about taking up our cross. And right away you think, oh yeah, that's my cross. I don't know what you think about when you think about your cross. <laughs> But let's, let's look at that for just a moment. Taking up your cross. Let's look at uh, Mark 10, 21. Mark 10, 21, when Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said to him, we know this story too. Jesus says, one thing thou lacks. Actually, that's pretty good, isn't it? Only lacked one thing. <laughs> that's really close. One thing thou lackest. Go thy way, sell whatever you have, Give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross, and follow me. Take up your cross. Take up your cross. There's one thing we need to understand here. We are not to make our own cross. <laughs> See, a lot of people make a cross because it's something they don't like. <laughs> they say, that's my cross. No, God didn't say you could do that. <laughs> you can't pick and choose a cross. You are not permitted to choose the cross. Your cross and my cross is prepared for us by divine love. And we take it up by choice. <laughs> Nobody's going to force you to take up your cross. God has prepared something in that that you need. And he knows you need it. If you don't have it, you could be lost. There's something you need to experience. There's something you need to understand. There's something you need to be the victor of, over. You need to know you have dealt with your cross because God has given it to you to make you a conqueror of all things. And so, if we're going to take this up by choice, we should do it cheerfully. <laughs> yeah. Not only willingly, but cheerfully. 
not murmuring and complaining and grumbling. Oh, oh, I have this terrible cross. <laughs> the word here is submission. That's one of the things God is trying to teach us. That doesn't come natural. <laughs> Submission. You know, I think about a, a statement Jesus made. I had a hard time with it. I'm not saying I've got it down. I'm just saying I couldn't even understand it. <laughs> I'm catching the rays of it now, and I'm beginning to catch what he was saying. When he said, don't resist evil. That just blew me away the first time I saw it. And for a long time afterward, I thought I was supposed to resist evil. <laughs> and here Jesus says, don't resist evil. And I cogitated and cogitated and prayed and asked the Lord to show me, well, what does that mean? I can't do it if I don't know what it means. What is that? What's being said here? Don't resist evil. And little by little, the rays began to come as I saw the things that he said might attach to that. Now, we've all seen one that most people say it's impossible to do. Love your neighbor like yourself. <laughs> How are you doing with that one? Don't raise your hands. <laughs> Love your neighbor as yourself. And all the realists in the world say, oh, that, nobody could do that. <laughs> well, then why did Jesus say it? <laughs> and so that one got over in there. And then the one that helped me more than anything to, to begin to piece it together love them that persecute you. Uh, yes. <laughs> Love your enemy. And then I began to understand a little bit. Don't resist evil. Love that enemy. See? How can I love him if I'm resisting him? If I'm trying to beat him off? If I'm trying to get rid of him? If I'm trying to neutralize him so he can't hurt me? <laughs> I'm resisting. I am not submitting to God and allowing him to take care of things. You see where submission goes? It's a lot bigger thing than we're used to thinking about. Submission means you really do. <laughs> you let God be God. He's, he's the one in control, not us. I don't know how many times I thought I'm in control. <laughs> And it always ends up the same way. I don't control anything. <laughs> don't kick at it. Don't thrash around trying to worry about this. Don't fall underneath it so I can crush you. Just submit to God. Take your yoke. See, that's what we're talking about. Jesus says, take my yoke. Now, he didn't say you have your own yoke that's separate from the whole universe. That's yeah, not possible. Jesus says, take my yoke upon you. My yoke is easy. Now, I misunderstood that one for a long time until I realized Jesus was saying, he has a yoke. <laughs> And it must be okay if he has one. <laughs> and then I advanced along my understanding and I realized, well, what he's saying is, you take mine on you. We'll do it together. <laughs> and that changed the whole thing. I don't have a yoke anymore. I'm with him. <laughs> mm -hmm. And of course, that's the way they always do it. When they're smart, you get a big bull and you get a bull that's cross-eyed and doesn't know where exactly where he's going and you put them together and the big bull will control things <laughs> because they're yoked that little one 
The one that's not so smart can't go wandering off. He just uses his strength where the big one goes. <laughs> and so Jesus is the smart one. <laughs> and that's a good arrangement, isn't it? Jesus is wise. He's benevolent. He's love. Can you think of a better guide? What a, what a wonderful arrangement God has made that he will yoke us with Jesus so we don't get in trouble. Well, if you're going to have a burden, can you think of a better burden? <laughs> we get to carry the same yoke Jesus is carrying. Now, I have to say one thing about the cross. When God chooses for us out of love to help us, develop us, to make us into what we would want to be ourselves, that cross is not made out of feathers. <laughs> yeah. It's not velvet lined. And I have to tell you, it is a terrible burden to the disobedient. Yes. The one who will not put their shoulders to it willingly and cheerfully is going to have a bad, bad time. As a matter of fact, we are told in Steps to Christ about page 44, the person who just does it because they, they have to, they're supposed to. And they really have not chosen this voluntarily because I love God. That religion is worth nothing. The fire escape doesn't work. <laughs> love is the only thing that works. Love to God because he loved us first. And so the man of sorrows, he knows about burden carrying, and, and he carries it. Our cross, our yoke, his yoke, and we can carry it with him. And you want to know something? Once you understand this correctly and you do it with him, you go through that with him, soon you will love it. <laughs> Isn't that strange? But I know that's what happens. Soon you will love it because it's with him. And you will then understand what Moses meant. I would rather, rather have God coming down on me than have all the pleasures of Egypt. <laughs> Yes, give me anything with Jesus. You can have the rest of this world. <laughs> and you know, when he carried it, it didn't look pretty. I guess he even made a picture of it, a motion picture. I didn't see it. I don't plan to ever see it. There's no way they can show me what God has shown me about that in that movie. But when Jesus went through that, after that came the crown. And he showed us the way. First, you learn to suffer with him. You've got a crown waiting. The crown is sure. The coming weight of glory must mean something to us. I think it might take some of that heaviness away. <laughs> we can keep our eyes focused in the right places. So God is asking us through these few things we're looking at today to go forth with a holy, submissive spirit. Live your life that way. In meetings, I used to say it in a way I'm sure wasn't very clear. I used to tell people, you have no rights. 
no right to get mad at somebody. God took that away from you. Jesus has paid for all of that. You don't have a, a right to be momentarily gratified. Jesus paid with his blood. You don't have any rights. We must learn how to be submissive to love. Thank you. When Jesus says, come, I'm sure you're glad he added that word come because I would have misunderstood all of this. He said, come, follow me. The natural thing to think is, there he goes, and you've got to try to catch up. That's not what he meant when he said, come. You come right here next to me, follow me, go with me. <laughs> We're yoked together now. I'm not following way back someplace. I'm right there with him. Okay, someone says here it's easier to love one who loves us. Well, yes, I guess that's what <laughs> everybody can do. Said, but we tend to love what's more easily. Well, that's unfortunately true. The natural man is not a friend of God. We, we need to understand that. I'm going to digress for just a moment. I want you to remember for a second on the other side of Jordan and then bring it across with you. Over there, you had leprosy. There wasn't a clean spot on you. And the way they teach it today is that when Jesus gets a hold of you, he cleans you all up and he brings you into Christianity and now you don't have leprosy anymore. You have been made clean. Well, I want to tell you something. If you have that idea, you're going to get in trouble someday. It's going to come. You still have leprosy. There isn't a clean spot on you. Jesus is saving you. There's nothing you can do to get rid of that leprosy. You are a sinner. And if you have let that go, you have a problem. You must have Jesus save you today the same way he saved you the first day you became a Christian. You must be as dependent upon God this moment as though you were dying of leprosy. You need him. You can't do anything to save yourself. All right, that thought just came to me as we're dealing with this. We need to be sure we know what we're doing here. We're in the land because of Jesus. We are participating in the fruit because of Jesus, his merits. The Father accepts it all. God the Father loves us. Jesus loves us. But you better not forget, you still don't deserve anything. <laughs> it's Jesus' worth that gives it to us. And we ought to be thankful and grateful every day. That's, that's how he looks at it. <laughs> and that's the way it is. We don't despair because we're sinners anymore. We're not cast down because we're sinners anymore. We are thankful that we have a Savior, a mighty Savior, and he's good for it right now, this instant. <laughs> when do you start being like that? <laughs> Why did he become my savior? Over there in Micah 5, 2, I think he has an answer for us. We're dealing with very familiar scriptures, but I hope we can see they make a picture when we see what God's trying to tell us through these words of Jesus. 
Verse 2, it says, But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruled in Israel. Okay, so this is talking about Jesus, right? He's talking about where he's going to be born. But notice what it says. Whose goings, Jesus, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Well, that's a long time to be going from everlasting. How long has he been going for me? You know, no new things have hit Jesus. From everlasting, he knew all about me. <laughs> From everlasting, he knew I was going to be a sinner. From everlasting, he knew what he was going to do to save me. And he's been planning that. From everlasting! <laughs> It's not a new thought with Jesus. It isn't something he invented after the cross. From everlasting. <laughs> From of old, Micah said. Long before I existed in history, Eventually, somewhere back there, he made a compact with the Father. Blood for blood, death for death. He gave himself way back there for you. He volunteered. There wasn't one little tiny bit of mumbling or grumbling in it. He wanted to do it, whatever the cost. And we will never know what it cost. He knew from everlasting they were going to spit on him. He knew how they would mock him. He knew how they would pierce him. And from everlasting, he decided, I'm going to be surety. I'm going to pay the price. The only one that could, he's going to pay the price. From everlasting. And so think about it. You in Jesus. Yes, you in Jesus. Way back in everlasting. Jesus did love you back then. Before there were any men, it was in his heart. So he has been a long, long time about your salvation. Will he accomplish it? <laughs> you see, we, we have to think like we're in the land now. It's different. We have to think a different way than we used to. We've got to get over into these real thoughts. Think what God thinks. Believe what God believes. His goings forth for so long about me. Will he lose me now? No. Don't think so. <laughs> Did he choose me before the mountains? I must remember these things. Yes, God chose me. I didn't choose him. Can he reject me now? There's no rejection from God. 
don't even begin to think it. If you're thinking that way, you're misunderstanding the judgment. That's not what the judgment is for. It's impossible for God to reject anyone who comes in the name of Christ. It's impossible. Well, we think about that. You know, that's a long time to love somebody. <laughs> it's a long time. That is a changeless love. How come he didn't get tired? <laughs> you know, we tend to get tired. We love somebody. We say we love somebody, and then something wears out, and we're not so sure anymore. Hey, that's not Jesus. That's not Jesus. He didn't get weary. If he was going to get tired of me, he would have got tired a long time ago. <laughs> See, my 50 or 60 years is nothing compared to where he's already been. Why should he get tired of me in 50 years? If he's already loved me for uh, who can count? That love, he proved, is stronger than death. Yeah, these, are, these are big thoughts. These are things that were so radical the devil didn't think about them before they came around. He has never seen anything like God. And he didn't see approved until he saw Jesus walking around. Sometime I'd like to talk about temptation. People get the wrong idea about temptation. Theologians in our church have the wrong idea about temptation. Temptation is not what you want to do. That's not what the word means. Temptation is a test in the universe to see how you're going to relate. Now, it's not a big contest with sinful men, what they're going to do. <laughs> There's no contest at all. And it wasn't a contest with any man that say never ran into until he saw Jesus. And then they kind of threw him that when he went after Jesus. There was something more about that man than he'd ever seen before. And I'd rather imagine that devil just pounded himself purple and blue trying to get Jesus to do something. And he kept sparking those fires at him, those temptations at him, and Jesus wouldn't move. Now Satan spent his whole career with Jesus tempting him. Now I want to ask you, where did the temptation come from? Inside of Jesus or outside of him? You remember that. Because even though we have the likeness of sinful flesh and we were sinners, Jesus had the likeness of sinful flesh and he was never a sinner. Never. Don't let anybody tell you he had the same thing as sinners have, a pull to sin. Don't ever let anybody do that to you. He never by a thought sinned. He was connected to the Father. He said, I delight to do your will. Your law is in my heart. And that's what he wants to do for each of us to get us to understand. I'm writing my law in your heart so you can say, I delight to do your will, God. Just like Jesus. Now his love would have turned for me a long time ago if he was going to do it. I know he's not going to just by that one fact. But I do have to say this much because there is a gospel we have to present to the world in a proper way. That the Father made a covenant with the Son. They shook hands on it. It's forever. 
They made it work. The cross, Jesus paid the full penalty. There's nothing more. The sacrifice was made. The atonement has not been completed, and that's what Christ Christianity today has not understood yet. The reason it's not completed yet is because all that the, has been done by the Father and Son, it must become effective. They've done it. But not every human has it. Why not? It only works when the Spirit of Christ comes into us. You see, the covenant, my brain can tell me God has made the covenant and He's been successful and salvation is there. And people say, well, all you have to do is believe. Well, I ask, believe what? You believe Jesus did it? The devil believes that. That doesn't change anything for the devil. What is it we're supposed to believe? Well, the first thing I'm supposed to believe is in my mortal self, I can't reach it. <laughs> oh, I can't jump up and get it. God didn't put it right here and say, here, put your hand out. He never said that. I haven't found a scripture that says that. That's the way some people use that word believe. No, God's kept her. We're supposed to be out of reach. I cannot get it. You know that's true. When you first came in, you wanted it and you weren't getting it. And after you were in, you forgot the formula and you tried again. And finally you got smart enough. You said, Lord, I can't give you my heart. I am not built in such a way that I can give you my heart. And when I finally realize that, then I can say the right part of it. It's too high for me, God. I can't reach it. Lord, I give you consent to take my heart. You do it. You give me your salvation. And that's what he does. He says, I will now bring it to you. Someone once said, it's like a, a big cask of precious wine, and it's up there, and it's available to anybody who can get to it, but nobody can get to it. <laughs> but the Spirit of God says, I can get to it. And so he dips my cup, and he brings it to me. And he says, here, drink. The Spirit of God gives it to us. When we consent for Him to do it, we call that surrender, by the way, He gives it to us. He gives it to us. He makes us born again. He turns us into a Christian. He makes us a new creation. And when He does it, it's done. It's real. It's accomplished. We must be called out of the darkness into the light by God's own Spirit. We're never going to reason this out. We can think we're smart enough to reason it out, but it's not possible. Only God can pull us into His kingdom, the kingdom of light. And then we can say, I know. See, not I believe, I have faith. And we can say, I know I have been called to an eternal purpose. And now my life means something because it's not me anymore by myself. I live. Not yet I, but Christ lives in me. And so when that temptation comes, and my old response is still in the brain, I've got something to deal with now. I've got to remember, I have a God to honor. 
And I can do it because Christ is in me. But if you just give up and say, oh, I can't help it. I'm an Italian. <laughs> no, no, no. You can help it. Our Christian can help it. We're going to be talking more about this because in the land, it's different. We must understand that. It's different. We're not alone anymore. The Spirit of God opens my heart to receive what God wants me to have. His own Spirit does that. He takes down from his treasuries and his storehouse, anything we need, and it actually becomes ours. Unbelief cannot enter into this place. Only the person who is responding to the Spirit of God dealing with, with the person. Without the Spirit, it's as though there were no plan of salvation as if the blood had never been shed. You can know the Bible inside and out and still be lost. You can go to church every week and still have nothing about God. Only the Spirit of God makes it work. And that's why he's trying to teach us submission. It's the only way he can bring it to us. When we realize we are helpless, when we realize we need him every minute of every day, and when you need him like that every minute of every day and you're thinking about it when you're being assailed, we'll talk about it. That's when he gives us the power to learn about overcoming. He begins to show us that with him, you don't live certain ways. With him, you live the way they live in heaven, <laughs> the way angels live, the way unfallen beings live. That's what we want to learn. And he wants to teach us in this setting where Satan says it can't be done. Yes, he wants us to learn it here so he can show us it to the universe as trophies and say, well, there's my proof. Not only of what I can do, I want you to see who I am. Look at my children. We have something to say about who God is. We're his proof. All right, I'm going to close the tape now. I can't get into this thing. I don't know how to get into this. <laughs> there we go.